Last week on Chain in the Valley, we sat down with Piranova's data product strategist, David, to discuss Golden Source and how it can solve some of the friction points within financial institutions. He also shared a blog post on the topic for those of you who want to know even more. And who doesn't want to know more? All right, who's ready for episode eight? You are listening to Peer Nova's Chain in the Valley, where we discuss all things blockchain and DLT over our morning coffee. Here are your hosts, Sonia and Navid. So today we have a very special guest on the show, Miss Perry Ann Boring from the Chamber of Digital Commerce. Um, for our repeat listeners, you remember that Peer Nova joined the Chamber a few months ago, and we were actually a sponsor at the DC Blockchain Summit. We really, really admire how the Chamber is working to bridge the gap between the blockchain industry and legislation, because that is kind of the final step for widespread blockchain adoption. So thank you for being here, Perry Ann. We would love for you to introduce yourself to our listeners. Thank you so much for having me. I'm Perry Ann Boring. I'm the founder and president of the Chamber of Digital Commerce. We are a nonprofit trade association headquartered in Washington, D.C., and we represent companies that are innovating and investing in blockchain-based technologies. So our mission is to promote the acceptance and use of digital assets and blockchain technologies. And we do that through working with our members, um, private companies innovating in this space, and the policy and the regulatory community and bridging those two communities together to address some of the biggest friction points for this ecosystem. And Pier Nova, we actually joined this year, so we're very excited. Um, Navid and I also attended the DC Blockchain Summit, which was absolutely insightful in terms of learning more about the legislation aspect. So great job with that. Um, would you mind giving us a quick overview of some of your current initiatives? Yeah, sure. So at the Chamber of Digital Commerce, we do have a very prolific platform. As I mentioned, we represent about 200 companies in this space. And our companies represent, one, both public companies, so major corporation, Fortune 500 companies, banks, financial institutions that are looking at blockchain. Some of the companies we represent include the NASDAQ, the CME Group, IBM, Microsoft, Cisco, Accenture, other names and brands that we're all familiar with. And then the other 60% of the membership is mostly private startups. So a lot of the very innovative technology entrepreneurs and a lot of the creative side of the industry. And by bringing those two groups together, magic really happens at the chamber. One, because each group learns so much from each other. Everyone brings different perspectives to the table. But also, as I mentioned, a big part of what we do is working with the policy community. And this technology very much impacts uh, many applications are within the financial services industry. And as someone who used to work on Capitol Hill, on financial services policies, and it is really important that if you are either trying to change the laws or update the laws or having issues with the laws, it's really important that you have the incumbent's perspective because they do have a very large say in the regulations around them. So our platform brings those groups together, and we've been very effective in our advocacy work. Three of the top projects that we're working on currently, one is our National Action Plan for Blockchain Two is work around AML, and three is around tokens. With our national action plan for blockchain is very at a high level. We're working to get blockchain recognized by the United States government as an important technology, and we are, have called on the U.S. government to put together a national strategy for how we're going to embrace this technology in the United States of America. Two, on AML, anti-money laundering regulations, there are many efforts underway to update and modernize the Bank Secrets Act and global anti-money laundering laws, both with FinCEN, OFAC, and the FATF internationally. So we've been very engaged with all of those bodies to make sure that all of our members, those who are in this space, truly understand what's happening to ensure everyone can always be compliant and that also the regulators have a deep understanding of how this technology works mm -hmm. to ensure the laws and the regulations take into account the unique attributes of blockchain technology. And then three on tokens. So tokenized networks are a very big part of the blockchain ecosystem. And there's a lot of debate and, and legal questioning around how mostly the securities laws are going to be applied into this ecosystem. So we have a very prolific body of work with the, the SEC and the CFTC 
to help companies and policymakers navigate those specific issues. So I want to ask a quick follow-up question. You mentioned that you are working to have the U.S. government recognize blockchain as very important technology. Why is that important? So in the United States and the chamber, we've we were established about five years ago, and we've just learned so much, and we've met with so many different stakeholders throughout the policy community, and just taking a step back and looking at where we are and the work that we've accomplished over the years, we are in a very complex regulatory environment. Just to kind of walk you through, uh, just quickly, what I mean by that, at the SEC, you know, I mentioned within securities laws, the SEC is you know, looking to define tokens as securities and implying the securities laws to the space. If you go over to the Treasury Department, FinCEN is regulating the same technology as a currency. IRS, which is also part of the Treasury Department, has said convertible virtual currencies will be taxed as property. So these, these tokens are subject to capital gains and losses. And then at the CFTC, they've determined that Bitcoin and other virtual assets are commodities. So between the security, currency, property, commodity, we're just getting started with the type of legal regimes that will be applied to the space. So a very heavy focus on financial services. But of course, that's not where blockchain applications end. Look at things like supply chain, look at um, what's happening in the healthcare sector with digital identity and the, the securing of data and information, blockchain is going to impact many different areas of our economy, financial services being a big one, but it's certainly not limited to that. In addition, if you look at the activities coming out of Washington, the majority of them are all focused on enforcement. It's all very negative. Mm -hmm. They see bad headlines. There's been a lot of weird stuff with Bitcoin and crypto, and that's what they see, and that's what they read about in the news, and that's what people know. And the, the, the activities and the focus are very much go after the bad actors and get rid of them and shut them down. Mm -hmm. Enforcement is an important part of having a rule of law and having healthy markets. I'm not saying that shouldn't happen. What we're advocating for is the other half of the conversation, which is currently absent in Washington today. Any activity that's happening in Washington, we first and foremost want the focus to be on we want this technology to thrive here because we do believe blockchain is going to add trillions of dollars worth of new economic activity to the global economy. And we want to make sure those benefits are realized in the United States. Many developed nations around the world are taking proactive steps to create an inviting environment for businesses to innovate on this technology in their jurisdictions. And right now, the United States is very far behind. So our National Action Plan for Blockchain, which we propose calls on two things. It's one, we want a clear statement of support from the United States government that says blockchain is an important technology. And two, we want the government to have a plan on how we're going to meaningfully address the growth of this technology. And we believe the time is now because we are falling behind. Um, the current landscape is, um, is complicated and it's also focused on negativity and we want to refocus that on the positive aspect. I think that's a great point. I think in general, we see a lot of uh, news that's sensationalized for the wrong reasons. Obviously, as you mentioned, I think ICOs typically have a sort of maybe a, a scammy sort of inclination to them to some extent. That's Of course, that's perception, but that doesn't mean that everybody is a bad actor. It's just, it's, I think it's, it's also very, very important from our perspective. We don't have a coin, we don't deal with coins, but at the same time, like yourself, we believe technology has a lot of value that can bring into the conversation. And of course, in, in our particular area of use cases, but I really do appreciate that. Yeah. And before it was ICOs, you know, in, in earlier days, it was all around Bitcoin and you mm -hmm. saw the Silk Road incident where people were buying illegal drugs with Bitcoin. And even today with Bitcoin being the, the currency of choice for ransomware. So there is criminal activity associated with this technology, but criminals abuse every technology. Right. But it's, it's also true. important that we're highlighting and focused on the potential this, that blockchain technology can bring to the markets. And partnering with other companies, names and brands that regulators trust, you know, the IBMs of the world, the Microsofts of the world, the Cisco's of the world, who have also spent a um, significant amount of resources building out this technology in their own way and, and making sure that Washington understands that some of the biggest companies in the United States of America, this is a part of their strategic plans. So again, there needs to be a path forward and clear statements of support for this technology here if we want it to thrive here. I'm going to ask a quick question about what you think is the sort of the main impediment to 
blockchain adoption as a whole. It's important to me because in the last four or five years here at Purnova, to me, the number one problem has always been around misinformation. However, you know, going back to what we just discussed, I think people are still confusing Bitcoin with blockchain and things like that. So sometimes it's that fundamental that, you know, there's, again, when you begin from that point of view that you're not entirely sure which one is which, and you can imagine how everything sort of gets bucketized into bad news, perhaps, or something along those lines. What do you think is the most important reason why we haven't perhaps seen you know, as much adoption as we could have. Of course, it's an emerging te technology. We know it's going to take some time. But what in your mind is the number one reason, perhaps? It's always people that are the problem, <laughs> right? <laughs> as you know, someone that's been in the space for some time, there's very strong personalities. And in some areas of the ecosystem, you do have hyper competition where people are just really focused on getting to market first and plowing down whatever gets in the way. Where we are today in the blockchain ecosystem, we're in very nascent stages of building out technology and this ecosystem. And right now is the time to work together because the challenges in front of us from addressing the misinformation, from educating the regulators, financial institutions, the public about what this technology is, about what it's not, that's, that's a massive effort within itself. The regulatory challenges that we face, these are all issues that impact everybody. And it's important that companies and the people in this ecosystem are working together to address them as a community. And once we have some basic infrastructure laid, the roads, the bridges, the tunnels, then we'll be off the races and it will be a more appropriate time to compete for market share. But if you know the ecosystem is not even, you know, and some of the basics aren't formed, we're only hurting ourselves by competing with one another, which is why I felt very strongly about forming the Chamber of Digital Commerce, because it allowed for a neutral platform. And again, we're a nonprofit. So myself and my team, we do not have equity in any of the companies in this space. We don't serve on the boards of any of the companies in this space. We are a neutral third party. And we allow for many different companies, large and small, to come together to share their friction points and then create a unified voice and a strategy to address those issues. And a lot of that is public policy focused because that's where some of the biggest friction points are. But we, we do work on other business related issues like education, working on things like smart contracts adoption, standards, guidelines, best practices for some of the basic areas in this space. And we've made a lot of progress, but we still have a lot of work to do. And I, I still feel very strongly that it's important that we have a community because we will be much stronger addressing these issues together. Absolutely. So looking forward, what does the Chamber hope to achieve within the next 18 months? Well, <laughs> we have a very aggressive agenda ahead. As you mentioned, Pernova has participated in our DC Blockchain Summit in the past, this July is our five-year anniversary. It's really hard to believe that we're already five years old. I feel so old <laughs> um, in this space. So we will be celebrating our five-year anniversary in July. And around our anniversary, we're hosting Congressional Blockchain Education Day. This is actually the third time that we've hosted this event. We host it every other year. And our goal there is to bring broader recognition and acknowledgement to blockchain in the halls of Congress. Congress continues to be one of the most difficult bodies to educate because, one, there's 535 members of Congress. And two, each one of those members, they oversee huge portfolios of issues. And so it's difficult to get an extended amount of time with them. And you really have to put forward some type of personal reason to get them interested in this space for them to do their own studying to become advocates. So on Congressional Blockchain Education Day, we're inviting all of our members to come to Capitol Hill. We are going to meet with as many members of Congress as possible on that day, make sure all of our businesses, our companies, our members meet with their member of Congress, share with them what they're doing in their home district. So there's a home tie to that member of Congress. And then we'll be promoting and asking the members to one, join the Congressional Blockchain Caucus, which is our group of advocates on Capitol Hill. And two, we'll be talking and promoting the National Action Plan for blockchain. So we're, you know, success for us this summer will be to have a strong advocacy event on Capitol Hill. We do invite all of our members to join us on that day. And we'll be celebrating our five-year anniversary 
around that. And then we'll see where that takes us and we'll see what doors that opens for us. And my bet is that we will see a very significant movement in making the National Action Plan a reality. Ariane, congratulations on uh, all your success <laughs> yes, with you. uh, you. with the chamber. And um, uh, as Sonia mentioned, we're very, very excited to uh, be a part of this organization. I, I couldn't agree with you more that so much education is needed. And, uh, you know, this podcast is an example of something that we're putting our, our resources into in order to make sure that the correct information, at least, is out there. But like you said, it's going to take some time. And I think, you know, uh, members of Congress that you mentioned, I'm sure they have a, a lot of things on their plates. And this is probably something very small, but it is important to us that they get the correct information and they can make their, their decisions based on that. But thank you so much for taking the time to sit down with us today. Thank you. Yes, Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. All right. Episode eight is a success. We are so thrilled to have gotten the opportunity to speak with Perianne today, and we're very excited to work more with the chamber this year. So thank you for listening to Chain in the Valley. And you remember, we cover all things blockchain and DLT over your morning, afternoon, or evening beverage of choice. You can also find us on iTunes, Spotify, Google Music, Stitcher, and chaininthevalley.com. Join the conversation and tweet us at Pure Nova Inc. or Chain and Valley because, well, we always love hearing from our listeners. Thank you for tuning in and have a great week.